Mac, another thinking link here in the RSP building. I should say the Grain Belt Brewery building designed by RSP, also happens to be one of our sponsors. We can give a big round of applause for RSP, right? Can we start it off that way? Because this is the main space. I love this. Yeah, absolutely amazing space. Great place to come and be creative, for sure. Um, we have two new interesting sponsors on the list. Lake One, who if you want anything HubSpot, you contact Lake One. That's all I can say about them. Actually, they've got a description here, but a uh, modern growth and technology partner, which we probably actually wrote this, um, helping B2B businesses navigate uh, digital transformation across marketing, sales, and customer experience. That's respect to the writer who wrote this, hopefully. Anyway, um, the other exciting one is REM5 Studios. They have a virtual environment and you can actually, well, maybe not through your phone, perhaps, I don't know. I don't know the technology well enough, but it's a virtual environment. And if you're in it right now, you're going, yes, I know I'm in that virtual environment and I'm watching you speak. Um, it's not the metaverse, it's some other verse. It's cool, it's interesting. You should definitely check it out if you can't make it here or you know, if it snows, which it often does, but not hopefully in July. Anyway, we have an amazing pairing of guests on this one, uh, two, uh, I can say, good friends of Capsule and of us, and both of Kitty and I as well, because we both have met them a long time ago. So one other plug for the firm that puts this on, which is Capsule. If you get a chance, go to capsule.us, check us out. And really the only reason we do this is to get the reviews on Google. So if you could go to Google, there's a review. You can scan a QR code somewhere, right, Dilly? Yeah, scan the QR code, put up a review, rave about us. We love those, it's always good. Um, and that's enough about us because I'm gonna move it over to Kitty. Thank you. As always, Aaron and Capsule, thank you so much for letting me come in and co-host. Uh, this is a pleasure today to be sitting next to you, James, as always, and hi, Paco. <laughs> uh, what a thrill. So buckle up, because these two are amazing thought leaders. The stories that they have are incredible. What I love about having conversations with both of you is that every time we talk, we learn something new. We hear about brands that, um, that we're interested in hearing about. So thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna kick us off with some introductions. Uh, well, first of all, sorry, I jumped ahead because I'm excited. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Kitty Hart. I'm the Vice President of Brand Experience at Heroic Productions and we do corporate event production. All right, and I'm just happy to, to be asked to co-host. All right, so James, I'm just gonna do a short introduction for each of you and, uh, and then let you take it from there. So James Damien here to my left uh, is a design thinking expert, a creative strategist and a motivational speaker. Um, you have worked with leading global brands. So if you could kick us off with just an overview of what has brought you to today. If you can distill that down. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try and be short. Um, the journey for me uh, started back in Philadelphia, where I was born. And um, I always majored in music, art, and design throughout high school. Um, the journey started when I was um, granted a, a place I was grant, is that okay? Okay. I was granted a place on all state chorus. So that's the beginning. Um, it led me to Westminster Choir College in Princeton, um, where I was totally humbled by the talent. Um, but the one thing that stuck from that experience was um, I majored in um, piano voice and conducting. I fell in love with conducting and I, I use conducting as a me metaphor for leadership in general, but most importantly, creative leadership. Um, uh, so I dropped out um, and I didn't know where I was going to go. Um, so uh, I went to Woodstock. Um, Cause that's what you do. I found found my place there. Um, 
And when I came back, I remember having a conversation with uh, a girl that I dated in high school once. But we got back together again and we were just recapping where we went off to. She went off to New York and I was, you know, nowhere uh, at that point. And it's because of her that she said, you know, you should come to FIT in New York. And that's where she was. And uh, I think it might have been for another reason. In any case, um, we both fell in love, uh, fell in love with uh, New York City. And uh, from there, design, uh, visual merchandising, exhibition design was my major. And it connected me with the windows in New York. So that's where I started. From the windows in New York, I met some really great leaders, one of which is in the Gucci book. Her name is Dawn Mello. Um, they saw something in me that I didn't see in myself because all I wanted to do was just be a window director. That was my goal. And it, uh, you know, life has a way of surprising the hell out of you and taking you to different places, as well as people that saw something in you and uh, suggested a different path. That path led me from the windows to the interiors, which eventually led me to a meeting with my mentor, Gene Moore at Tiffany and Company. We were sitting at a table. There was an executive search person that just gathered a search and it was Best Buy. That search took me to a place that I never imagined. Uh, Gene and I sat at the table, we looked at each other. If you don't know Gene Moore, Google him. Um, the man that invented the Robin's Egg Blue Shade for Tiffany and Company and all the boxes, the great collections and those fabulous windows. So that he said, James, I'm too old now to travel. People want to talk to you. You should always show up. So I did what he told me and I ended up at the table with a CEO named Brad Anderson. I didn't come to the company, I came because of the leader. And it's so rare, and we'll talk about this today, that when you see a leader that is a servant leader, that doesn't have all the answers, but is curious to bring people in so that the capability of your practice has a seat at the table. He did that for me. Um, from Best Buy, uh, during my term there, he said, James, I want my officers in the company to experience private board work as well as public board work. And you'll be the first one. So I'm offering you either the Walker so that you can represent Best Buy, the Guthrie or the orchestra. And I said, I'll take the orchestra. I'm a failed conducting major. And that introduced me to a whole new world. And that world led me to one of the most, you know, outrageous places that I never dreamed of because of the board member having a stake in a company called Buffalo Wild Wings. So first it was the orchestra board. He introduced me to the CEO. She's a, another great leader. Her name was Sally Smith. And that's how I ended up at Buffalo Wild Wings. And Two years later, the chairman decided to step down and he said, don't hire a fancy executive search firm. The answer lies within. So the executive um, um, chair went out on this search, calls me a month later and says, all right, we found somebody, James, and it's unanimous. And I said, aren't I a board member? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, what am I, chopped liver? I'm not even a part of the conversation. Who is it? Oh, he said, that's easy, it's you. And the, I remember the first thing he said to, uh, that I said to him, I said, do you guys know what you're doing? <laughs> I'm starting to lose faith in you. 
And he said, yes, we certainly do. And it's because you have brought people together. And the importance of creative leadership is to make sure that every discipline in the company has a seat because that's how things get done. And that's really the essence of our topic today. So that journey has now taken me overseas and my, my practice is all about culture preceding everything because culture is capable of greatness on one hand and it's also the enemy of change and both live together. And boy, have I experienced that throughout my journey. And that's caused me to really think differently about what I did, what I do, and what's most important. Because culture, philosophy precedes strategy. And that's my journey today. I don't know where it's going next, but go ahead, Darren. One of the reasons why this is great that this is virtual is that you're going to be able to share this, right? They'll, yes. So, so many of the things that we will talk about today, you will want to share with your teams back at your companies uh, because they, these will be amazing stories. And you're right. I mean, we're all dealing with change on a regular basis. So um, thank you for that. I always love hearing that story. All right. Hello, Paco. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, Paco, I'll give you just a brief uh, introduction here. Founder of EnviroCell, uh, the inventors of the science of shopping. Uh, author of Why, Why We Buy. If you are in retail and you have not read that book, you need to read that book. Pull up Amazon right now and grab it. Uh, as well as other best-selling books on the evolution of consumer behavior. Um, you are a columnist for the Robin Report and commentator on radio and television. So Paco, we'll ask you the same question. If you can, please give us an overview of uh, where you started, your journey, and what you're doing now. What a nice question. And I'm going to answer it a little differently than my buddy James has. I often tell people that I'm a refugee from the world of ac academia, that some 40 years ago, I was a poor part-time adjunct instructor in a doctoral program in environmental psychology or the effect that space has on people's be behavior. One of my part-time jobs was to be part of the crew that went around to different cities across the country and rewrite commercial zoning ordinances. I had my moment of epiphany on the roof of the Seafirst Bank building in Seattle. As you can't tell because I'm on a screen, I'm six foot four. But the joke that I tell is I'm one of the few tall people I know that gets height sick with two pairs of socks on. And on the roof of the Seafirst Bank building, 60 floors up, I was installing the cameras on the edges of the building to record the traffic patterns on the streets below. And there was a stiff wind blowing and I could feel the building rocking in the breeze. And I got really scared. I, I promised myself as I came down uh, from that roof that I would reinvent my profession. A week later, I was standing in a bank in New York City, getting madder by the moment and realized that the same tools I'd been using to look at how a city worked or to understand the dynamics of a, of a plaza, um, I could take inside a bank or a store and maybe start to figure out how they worked and maybe help them work better. Um, and I had never taken a business course, never taken a marketing course, never worked in retail, never worked in banking, but I started knocking on doors. And the two first clients that I got, one was Citibank, who were installing the first ATMs. This was back in 1977. And Citibank thought that ATMs were, were going to get them out of the retail business. I don't quite know why. 
but in effect, part of what it did is to attract people. And part of what we were able to document for them, not only in alphanumeric fashion, but using motion picture cameras, that one of the critical aspects of the transition from a technology to an appliance is its acceptance by women. Who were the first operators of telephones? Women. Who were the first operators of desktop computing? They were women. Who were the first adapters to an AT ATM where it could get them in and out of the bank really fast so they'd have time to do other things? It was women. The second client that came through was Burger, Burger King. I knew nothing about QSR. And part of what was shocking, stepping off into that world of the design of a prototype store, was recognizing that the tools that most retailers use to understand their market was asking people questions. And I knew as an environmental psychologist that what people say they do and what they actually do is ultimately different. And part of what also shocked me is that there were things that we were able to document and to record that were, to me, painfully simple issues that came as a complete surprise to the client. Men and women coming into a QSR make distinctly different choices on the tables that they choose to sit in. I mean, doesn't that make sense to you? Okay. Of course it makes sense. We came up with a rating system to look at cars that parked in the parking lot where the people came in the door and got their burgers and sat in the restaurant and, and the cars that went through the drive through where they picked up their burgers and went somewhere else. Now, doesn't it make sense to you that there is a more affluent QSR customer who would make the choice not to go in the restaurant to pick it up and either take it home or eat it somewhere else? This was the start of the recognition that there was a meeting of art and science. That even though I did not understand how to design a store, I could tell how people work. And that one of the things that was just very exciting is that we were able to come up with often painfully simple changes that could make an immediate result. And the word got around really fast and the phone started to ring and the people started spilling over the transom. It was uh, some of my friends at, at became Target, there was Walmart, there was the bookstore business, there was the music business, the telecoms. AT&T was one of the first. And part of what was exciting here is that we were able to come back having run a job and go, here are three things that you could do tomorrow. Here are three things that you could do next week. And here's a bunch of things that maybe you should start thinking about later in the future. But it was also stepping off into the world of retail design and visual merchandising. And it was a world that I knew very little about, though I'd had numerous conversations with window dressers as I tried to figure out, James, you know, what made a good window. And you know what? There is a very dark secret here. And I think that's how I'm going to end my monologue. If you go back to the issues of DDI and VMSD, the design magazines that covered the retail industry starting in the 1970s, and you look 70s, 80s, 90s, a remarkable number of prize winning stores were closed within a year because while the critics loved them, the public didn't. And that one of the uh, issues that uh, James and I and the industry has tried to face is not that we're trying to limit what the creative juices are. And it doesn't mean that you always have to play by the rules, but if you break the rules, you better do it really well. And that, that moving forward, there was a way to be able to look at what are the biological constants? What are the things that stay the same? 90% of us are right-handed. 
my wife may be five foot two, I may be six foot four, but the ratios of distances here fall within the same parameters. Our eyes in the same age in the same way. But one of the things that makes our profession, and I feel as if I'm part of the broader retail design and visual merchandising and the cyber community, because the largest clients that we've had over the past year, 10 years have been global technology companies looking at that cyberspace. But the part of what has been very important here is recognizing that what made a good website in 2010 or what made a good store in 2010 and what makes a good web or a physical presence today is different. And it's testament to the evolution of us. And the degree to which we as a profession can understand what that evolution is and to be able to predict where it's going to go and be able to be answerable to the truth. I'm just a refugee from academia. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> Paco, uh, I, can, I can attest we've met in person and six foot four is a little bit intimidating but he's very kind and very wonderful to talk to. Um, we talk about the fact that Jane Goodall did not interview the gorillas. Observation research is the purest form of research. Mm -hmm. And I had just thought that you are essentially the Jane Goodall of retail research. <laughs> um, because... Well, you know, I grew up with a terrible stutter. And I grew up as the son of a diplomat where we moved every 18 months. And we moved all over the world. English is not my first language. And one of the things people have pointed out to me is that I used a coping mechanism to a handicap and turned it into a profession. And that is the ability to watch, listen, and process. Yeah, I, that's the other thing that, and I wasn't sure if you ever talked about that or talk about it a lot publicly, but it is amazing to me how you have handled that and turned it into a strength because people don't realize that. And it's absolutely amazing to me. I've had other people who have a stutter say, go watch, watch him, observe him like he observes other people and you will learn. It's amazing. Anyway, I could go on and I don't need to do that. Uh, let's see. We need to get into the interdependence of science and design. And James, I'd like to start with you with your definition of that. Because that's why we're here. Well. Um... I consider myself to be a right brain ambassador in the left brain world of business. And um, I've also learned that the art form of creativity and design needs to start with an understanding of science. And science to me is the discovery of knowledge. Knowledge for the betterment of humankind across any sector across the world. Did everybody hear that? <laughs> Keep it up. Okay. Um, so uh, to me, science is constantly in the pursuit of knowledge. And we hold that truth so preciously especially as designers, because if science is the why, the why we want to learn, the investigation, the relentless pursuit of information that can help us, that can help the world. So design is the response mechanism that's needed to make science visible. Design is the how. So I'm always so interested in the why and the how, that they're kindred spirits, that none is more important than the other. It's about pluralism and it's about tolerance and it's about the search for understanding a different point of view than yours, because you are only one person. 
And this will go back to anchor into the art of conducting. I use the art of conducting as a metaphor. And I would like all designers or all leaders for that matter, especially CEOs, to really embrace the fact that we don't have all the answers, that we cannot play all of the instruments, but our role is to bring those instruments, those disciplines together under the umbrella of serving a common goal. And that's culture. Because if designers can create an open platform that welcomes divergent thinking, no such thing as a bad idea, creating a comfortable environment where science and design and all other disciplines can try to solve those problems. And that to me is the most important definition of not only those two partners, but the importance of diversity, diversity of thought and all those other things that make us different. Embrace them, challenge them, but do it under a creative umbrella that allows everybody to share and share their ideas without fear. We need more of that as leaders of organizations. And my challenge today in the work that I do is trying to persuade CEOs that they're not as smart as they think they are and that they're furthest away from the customers that they serve. And the only way to get closer to it is through your employees. So the management philosophy that I've adopted over these years is celebrate the human dignity of every employee. James, do you work one-on-one -on -one with CEOs on this? Or? Yes, I do. It's a struggle. Um, and, um, you know, if you have time for a quick story, um, uh, one was um, after I left Best Buy, well, first of all, I sent out a letter to everybody that I knew in the company and elsewhere that I was going to transition out of Best Buy. I told you the reason why I went there was because of the leader. And when he announced his retirement, I think it's time for me to leave. But I wanted to have a proper transition. So I cut a deal with uh, the EVP of Human Resources and I said, I too am going to leave, but I'd like to leave on my terms. And here's the way I think an exit strategy should look like. And they were willing to accept it. Why? Because after 13 years trying to develop a design capability against all odds, um, I didn't want to see it go away. I wanted to make sure that there was proper handoff and that my team could rise up and take on that responsibility. Idealistic, Naive, yes, but no regrets. So I get a call when I make the announcement I, I, uh, from two CEOs. One was in London, the other was in Istanbul. I'll tell you the one about the CEO in Istanbul. He calls me and he says, I need you, James, to design a new store for us in Istanbul. Consumer electronics company, Technosa. His name was Mehmet, and he said, but I need you to design it in 15 days. And I said, Mehmet, thank you for the call. Um, there's no way I can do that. And, you know, sometimes CEOs can be, they don't like no. They just don't like no. I hate to generalize, but it has been my experience on both sides. Um, <laughs> so Mehmet, <laughs> Mehmet says, what do you mean, no? And I said, well, it's simple. 
it would be very presumptuous of me to impose my design aesthetic on your company. Why, he said, because I do not understand your culture. I do not understand your customers. And I know that there are different rituals and different behaviors from one company, one country, one company, and that we have to first immerse ourselves in understanding that. And uh, he said, okay, so how much time do you need? And I said, well, the only way, I, I'm trying to save you an airfare ticket here. I'm trying to say no very politely um, because I don't think it's going to satisfy what you believe you need. And that's an important distinction. We sometimes think we understand what we need and then serendipity happens. We'll talk about that later too. So Mehmet said, okay, what are the terms? I said, I need six to eight weeks of science and research and understanding customer behavior. But more importantly, I wanna understand your employees. And I start first by understanding where is their pain? He said, why? And I said, it's quite simple. First, I have to please myself. Second, I have to please the employees because they're this precious interface to the customer. And that's where your results come from. They don't come from you. And if you happen to like what we will do within your organization, it will merely be a coincidence. And that is a piece of advice that I witnessed from my mentor at Tiffany and Company, Gene Moore. He actually had the courage to say that, which gave me the courage to say that to him. And you know what? You stand in your own truth, great things can happen. And I worked with him for two and a half years and we rolled out a new concept within his own organization, where we brought people together that never even worked together. That's the joy. Multidisciplinary, integrated, collaborative behaviors end up through breakthroughs and innovation. Wow, okay. <clears throat> yeah, that was, uh, that was good. That was very good. Paco. Uh, your definition of the intersection between science and design and our subject okay. matter of the day. I, I, think, I think part of what we are looking at here is that the role that I have played and that my company has played hasn't been the quarter quarterback, has been the coach. Okay, And that the degree to which we can help people see things better. I have six things which I think are critical. First is recognizing that courtesy of our phones and our screens that we're on, the connection between our eyes and our brains has, has shifted. And therefore, under understanding the science of how we see and how that is changing. Ride the New York City subway and you see everybody down looking at their screens. Climb on an airplane. How much time do you spend? What are your kids doing looking at it? What's the difference between what you see at age 60 and what you see at age 18? The lenses in our eyes yellow as we get older, the way I see color at 71, and the way my stepdaughter sees it at 21 is different. Again, these are differences that are tied to science. Second, is one of the things that as I stepped off into the world of market research in the late 1970s, the seminal difference in behavior was between men and women, okay? And one of the things that's happened is that the 
is that the difference between men and women's behavior has gotten a lot fuzzier. And some of the differences here are based on the impact of birth control, but it is also women stepping off into the world of business where they never used to be. Thank God. Um, part of what this has meant is that historically within the world of retail, we sold women apparel, beauty products, and food. And now, as, as, as James can tell you, they're the single most important buyer of technology on the planet. And having worked in Turkey on technology issues, I can attest to that. This is, again, one of those things that is part of what that science is, is understanding the nature of evolution. Third issue is generational. Do you know that once we reach age 40, 80% of our weekly purchases are the same thing. I mean, we've decided the kind of mustard, the kind of whatever. Why does it have to come to us in packages meant to scream at us from the shelf if we've already made our commitment to it? This is, again, a very important part of understanding the science of the evolution of the consumer and how they buy. Next issue here is the role of time. I can stand at the doorway to a store or I can stand at the edge of somebody walking into a website and I can tell you with a great deal of accuracy how loud the clock is ticking inside someone's head. Part of what we're looking at is that the science of retail in 1930 when we designed a grocery store was I'll put the milk in the farthest corner away from the front door because the longer I keep somebody in the store, the more money I'm going to take out of their pocket. Does that make sense in 2023? The answer is absolutely not. Absolutely not. We are multitasking in our lives. And what is the role of that multitasking in the context of both how we deal with this and how we deal with physical spaces? Again, there's a science to that process here in terms of understanding. Next issue is one that James touched on, which is what is global and what is local? I have worked in 50 different countries over the past 35 years. I've worked, for example, on telecom issues all over the world. And I can tell you that there are some differences between how in shops for technology products in Istanbul versus Dubai versus Albany, New York, much less San Francisco, much less Warsaw, Poland. And some of those differences are absolutely predictable could be based on topography, could be based on the difference between uh, the rich and the poor. It can be based on the technolo technological literacy of the audience walking in the door. But having that perspective on what that process is, is part of understanding the evolution of science, which I think is one of the topics that James and I have a great deal of fun talking about. And the final issue here is, again, I think a very critical one and one that we see everywhere. And it's an issue whether you're talking about designing for Shanghai or you're talking about designing for Singapore or you're talking about designing for Dubai or you're talking about designing for Mexico City, much less Minneapolis or Kansas City. And that is the evolution of money and that we recognize that up until the mid uh, 1990s, the overwhelming majority of global wealth was in the hands of an aristocracy. Today, the overwhelming majority of global wealth is in the hands of people who earned it in the course of their own lives. And the peaches and cream complexion of money just no longer exists. And this gets back to that issue that, that James was talking about in terms of understanding diversity. Part of what this gets at here is, again, one of the fundamental challenges that that art and science meeting has, which is that often in order to make the sell, we have to provide the education. Why do I buy this t-shirt rather than this t-shirt? Why do I buy this phone rather than this phone? Part of what we're looking at in terms of that meeting of art and science is is also looking at an understanding of movement. 
how does somebody move through cyberspace and what's the difference between someone who's coming there the first time versus someone who's never who's experienced with it we can look at the movement patterns of somebody moving through a store and how does that affect visual merchandising that art and science here is one that is so exciting because unlike traditional science where you need a pile of evidence in the world of art and science and de design part of what we need is an inkling of what the nature of the problem is and we need a willingness to be able to look at it and a sense of humor about coming up with an answer thank you for listening to that monologue that was great. I'm going to go back to the beginning. Of, did you say 80% of the things we buy at our age are the same? We haven't, we don't change brands at all. I think I heard 80%, which shocked me. Right. Another holy shit moment in this. Um, I should have identified the other ones previously, but I have to buy new mustard and it's going to be a different brand from now. <laughs> I am complete. No. I'm in defiance of that. That can't be, but I'm, I'm thinking back. I'm like, oh shit, it is. It is. I'm I mean, it's the same it's, stuff. It's, I'm buying the same brands. A part of what is really exciting, though, uh, about that rec rec recognition is that you've made, you've already made the commitment to the brand and the product. Why does it have to come to you in the same way? We are, one of the challenges that we're facing in the broader world of retail is that recycling is failing and repurposing is here. And we need to find a better way of getting it from the store to our refrigerator, to our cabinet, and beyond. Yeah, that is that's the better part of that story. Not just me switching mustards. Kitty, take it away. So if we can get a little bit more specific, because I think that this conversation, it's very high level. It can be um, hard to understand a little bit. Can you share what sort of trends are you seeing right now in this interplay between science and design or science and, and art? What are you seeing out there in the world on this topic that would help us understand it a little bit better? Uh, on my travels, I have witnessed that we are curious about immersive experiences. We beat those words to death. But how many great examples of a memorable experience can any of you cite? Maya Angelou once said, people will not remember what you have said, although I hope today maybe some of you might. She also said, people will not remember what you have done. But she closed by saying, people will remember how you made them feel. And isn't that why we're doing what we do? We need to understand how we bring humanity together through the tools of science and design, but also we have to be the advocates, the practitioners of fighting for that change so that there are more memorable experiences because that's what sticks. Visual learning is much more sticky than what we read. We know that to be true. The leaders of companies and organizations today need to be humble, need to understand that the more that companies bring people together and create memorable experiences, it's a do good, do well philosophy. But we see it ever so often and certainly not enough. Um, and that's where fighting for creating a trend, more than just a trend, it's about changing our mindset. 
It's about changing behavior. And how many of you have walked into a retailer or a restaurant and immediately felt comfortable? I belong here. I love this place. Ask yourself the reason why. Because humanity is present. Yes, it also happens to have great food and tastings of wine and all of those other things that are human. So the trend that I am fighting for to take it from trend to systemic institutional behavior within companies is the most important thing that I can be doing by sharing my experience and my, my advice to creating that physical retail or anything else that faces off with people must deploy the five senses, every one of them in harmony, taste and touch and sight and sound and smell. And that creates memory. And that's the gateway to memorable experiences. Design is merely a facilitator. But we have to change the mindset of leaders of these organizations so that they can see it. And that's why the important thing within organizations and something I learned the hard way at Best Buy is that I try to inject that cell into Best Buy by having them think differently that this is about creating a technology wardrobe. I'm an old fashioned guy, but high end fashion retail knows service and knows how to put collections together that inspire you. The silent salesperson, if you will, that form in a menswear store, the mannequins in women's fashion stores, those are the things that trigger. I never thought of putting that combination together. And that was my hardest battle at Best Buy. But after 13 years, I thought that we really cracked the code and we did some amazing work together. And um, that's where the joy is. Because when you can see or hear some of your customers talking to other customers about what just happened, then you know you're onto something. And what you wanna try to do with an immersive experience is, is make your customers the sales force because they are the influentials in all of our communities. Who do you go to? What movie have you seen? What book have you read? The influentials drive 30% of our GDP by just talking to one another. So today's message is find a way to balance virtual with physical and never lose sight of why virtual existed. It was to connect people. We can't lose sight of that. And the more that we work together across disciplines, the greater chance of serendipity occurs. Penicillin, Coca-Cola, two prime examples of serendipity. Dr. John Pembroke wanted to create an elixir that took care of, of soothing the intestines, you know, acid reflux. What happened? Look at the brand of Coca-Cola today. Serendipity. You start out on a path, you have to be open to possibilities and those possibilities unveil new realities. I did not know that story. Hmm? I didn't know that story. Yeah, he was a pharmacist okay. and um, the syrup was on the shelf of pharmacies, which ended up in the medicine cabinets of people. I love it. I think it's important to note that you know, James and Paco, you both, you work with global brands, 
but we what you just talked about can be applied to any any brand any company any every company that's represented here in this room today can apply the fundamentals of what you just shared it's so it's it's absolutely true these are universal good intentions and design is about sincerity science is about truth sincerity and truth need to be inseparable if that wasn't a pull quote i don't know what is that was elegant that was beautiful we have to note to paco that no one is on a cell phone here. No one is looking at their phone. They're all paying attention to you and to James, just so you know. Um, I keep looking around the audience to see if somebody's like, I'm bored. I'm going to look at my phone. It's not happening. Okay. Can I? Yeah. Paco, go ahead, please. I just, I, I, I just want to restate what James said in a completely different way. Okay. Okay. And that is one of the things that I believe in fervently is that if you walk into virtually any retail organization and you find the desk farthest away from the front door, that's where the person in charge sits. If you walk into a store, the person who's in the back of the store is where the person in charge sits. I believe fervently that we have to close that distance. And that part of what James and I have been talking about is, is there a way of getting us out on the floor and getting us up front. I am reminded by my colleagues. I serve on the board of a number of Israeli technology firms. And their point is, is that battles are won when generals get to the front lines. And that's where you exhibit leadership and you and you and you process and you and you learn. And that exercise of being able to shorten that distance and to understand what does it mean? I like the idea also of thinking standing up, meaning that so many of us are so much more comfortable sitting around a conference table, kicking something uh, around. And what I love doing is taking a small group of senior execs or owners of, and just going out and walking the floor of the store and looking, seeing, and talking. And often there's a reality check there that is really powerful. And part of what Justice James said is that that is an exercise in leadership, is being seen and being listened to. Right, James? Well said. I have to, I have to um, just say one thing to that, um, a real live example of what you just said, Paco. Um, when I was handed the baton to be chairman of Buffalo Wild Wings, the reason that they said it has to be you is that more of us on the board come from a financial background, auditing, um, chief financial officers, and so on, and uh, people that ran companies as well. Um, and the first thing that I did was inaugurate not a trend, a behavior that needed to get institutionalized. Exactly to your point, get up, stand up, and get the board to spend a day in the life of the people on the front line, which get, echoes your point. And um, they didn't like it. They said it was a waste of time, some of them, not all of them. But I had the support of the CEO because she was passionate about the people in the organization. And that led us to a new ritual where once a quarter, all the board members had to pick a store and they had to go through walking in the shoes of the employee where everything happens. Make no mistake about it, that's where the results are. And what happened was that they thoroughly enjoyed it. So our job in science, art, design is to push it. 
get them to understand where your business started with in the first place and don't ever, ever forget it. So getting a board and getting the sea level to the front lines is where the magic will happen because that experience you will bring back and you will have different outcomes and different perspectives because you walked in their shoes. First order of design thinking, empathy. Shut up, get out, and listen. That's, that's a perfect transition to let's get some questions from our audience. Nicely I'll done. The runner. Kelly, oh yeah, Kitty's gonna be the runner. Perfect, thank you. Questions for our guests? We don't have a lot of time, so you have to jump in quickly, otherwise we get to ask the questions. Anybody? Thank you. Uh, hi, Paco. Um, just to, first of all, I'd like to give you a career thank you. We first met 25 years ago when I was a brand new hire right out of college at General Mills. And we were working on the Pop Secret brand and you came in. It's all about in chapter 12 if you want to read about it in his book. But to James's point, you mentioned the fact that the question you asked is, what's the pain? And then what's your solution? but I made an entire career thanks to Paco because he's taught us to ask the next question, but what does the customer do? And that opens up a whole new window. Uh, now that I'm a professor, I'm on what the other direction, I now get the, the wonderful task of giving hundreds of students to require to read your book. So I have to ask you a question, Paco. Um, on the big three, design, merchandising, and operations, what do you see the latest trends around the biggest thing around security and making people feel safe? I know there's the tease about the butt brush effect and all of that, but now consumers are looking around more than ever in stores. We see that all the time when I send students out to watch customers, they don't know how to do it. We call them Paco paths. What are the paths that customers take? Can you talk about some of the latest trends you've seen with these new cultural aspects of retail experience? You know, and thanks again I, for a great, great, great book. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I, I just read quarter day segment for CNN is talking about, uh, about shrink. And that one of the things that merchants are having to confront in specific markets across the country is not only the casual theft, organized theft, but angry theft. And I think it's in cities where the topography, like San Francisco, is where the, the rich and the poor often live next to each other. Um, we know that if you're a 14-year-old uh, in the favelas of Rio, the slums of Rio, you have the same vocabulary of brands as a 14-year-old in Gross, in Gross Point, Michigan. One of the things that we're looking at across the broader world is that people are seeing the contrast and are angry uh, about it. And I think this is going to be a challenge because there are places, if you're in Dallas, that distance is great. But if you're in San Francisco, you have retail merchants that are running out of the city. San Francisco Center is just closed here. Nordstrom's is gone. Um, and I think it's 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 testament to the nature of conflict within the structure of our of our nation, which is something that we see on the news, um, and it is reflected in the dichotomy between what someone thinks, you know, in Greenwich Village in New York City, and what someone thinks in Millbrook, New York, and those are challenges. That's great. I do believe you have to explain the butt brush, though, because we haven't covered that. And there might be audience members who are going, I don't know what he's talking about. That's a little bit odd. OK, all right. All right. Uh, this is this was a term that I coined more than 40 years ago. And unfortunately, for better, or for worse, it may end up going on my tombstone. OK, and that is the simple premise that the more likely, particularly if you're female, you are brushed from the rear the less likely you are to convert from a browser to a buyer. And that one of the things we can talk about is that every item within the context of the store has a browsing coefficient. 
the amount of time it takes for somebody to make a decision. If it's tied, the decision is a lot faster. If it's vitamins, it's something else. And one of the ways in which we can affect the conversion rate is to understand the butt brush factor. Make sense? <laughs> yep. I would also like to add to that, if I may. Have you ever had a butt brush experience in an Apple store? It's impossible. It comes to one important point about experience and about design. Curation. If we spent more time watching how people behave and how they shop, the more we will understand the importance of curation and composing. They only have four categories of product. That was a conscious decision. And you can go to an Apple store today, which is still the highest productivity per square foot on the planet, any retailer. Who's next? Right behind them, Tiffany and company. Ask yourself the reason why. Yes, their products are expensive, but they last long and they connect with other products. They're wardrobing. They're creating collections that work together. We have to do more of that in the public domain so that we're gracious with our aisle patterns and we take down the barriers that inhibit line of sight because the average height of a woman, which is the most important customer on the planet, she can see everything. The average height of a woman is five foot four inches tall. We use that information in the work that uh, Paco and I did at Best Buy, which not only showcased the behaviors, but we did something about that information. The last bit of information on that work that we did 20 plus years ago is that we learned through heat maps and traffic patterns where people were going in the store. And the finding that enabled us to create new concepts at Best Buy was that 61% of the business was being done in 17% of the space. I went to management and I said, you have two choices, make your store smaller. That means you got to get rid of a lot of stuff or strategically relay out the store. And that gave us the license. So science research is my sword and my shield so that I can combat the naysayers, the P&L owners that think they own the store. <laughs> okay. We have one more, one more chance for one more question. Oh, and it's the great one, Judy Bell. <laughs> okay, this question is for Paco. I'm very curious um, about you said ab about time spent in stores, because it used to be if we could keep the customers in the stores longer, they would see more, they would buy more. And you were talking about how that has changed for 2023, but you didn't say why. What, what's the difference? Judy, I can stand at a doorway and I can look at somebody walking in and I can predict how loud that clock is ticking inside their heads. But part of what we are looking at, particularly with, with women in a post-pan world, is that they are busy trying to earn a living. They're trying to look after their kids. They're trying to do their look after their husbands and their, and their homes. And they're also trying to get some shopping done. And 
I think that that world of multitasking has taken the simple premise of the milk is in the farthest corner from the front door and made it something that just doesn't work anymore. Um, I love the fact that there are new grocery stores um, and ones that I'm going to be talking with you about next week here in my trip to St. Paul is where somebody puts all of the things that a stressed woman might need right at the front door. So that, yes, there is a time when she comes in and is willing to spend the 25 minutes, but there's another time where she really wants to get in and out as quickly as she possibly can. And, you know, welcome to that world of stress. Yeah, that's, that is Paco, that's absolutely amazing. We do have one more question. I wanna make sure I get it in. Thanks for squeezing my question in. Um, thinking about the experience in the retail environment versus the experience with online shopping, how do we bridge when I go into a Target, for example, but order from Amazon while I'm right in there? Great question. Um, I'll give you my point of view on that. Over time, when innovation occurred, whether it was a fax machine or a new technology um, or movie rentals, people thought, there go the movie theaters, they're all gone. And the same thing has happened ever since. They don't go away. They find a way to seep into society. And today, not a trend, but a ho I hope a new behavior respects the importance of both. You know, it's like we need more of that in the world, right? Well, we need to be able to understand how people use the tools that they have at their disposal and how that can inform and help the physical environment. That's why the trend in retail needs to be a new behavior in retail where we deploy the five senses. Why? We can't do it online. It's only sight and sound and our ability to surf. That is the motivator of where people go. And therefore, it is vitally important that we find the balance between them. When new technologies come out, we're totally infatuated with the new shiny disc. But it takes time. And from my dear friend Edwin Sloshberg, I learned this. It takes 22 years for something new to penetrate society where the period of infatuation of having it starts to teach us how to use it better for our life, for the rituals in our life. And that is an important ingredient to changing the retail experience. Why we're not doing it faster is beyond me, but I have learned to be patient but my runway is shorter today than it was when I started. So I'm getting a little antsy here. It's time for organizations to respect that so that the store is an interface and the interface is a store. Damn. Well, we are past our time. And I am, no, that is, and I think no one's uh, at all objecting to that fact. And, um, and Paco, did I hear you're going to be in St. Paul next week? Is that the case? That's right. I am. Where are you going to be? So these nice people can refer their friends to come see you, perhaps. Can they come see you at an event or just stalk you, perhaps? Uh, just stalking me. Um, I, am, I am there working for the Independent Natural Food Retailers Association. Oh, I know that organization. I love that organization. That's very cool. Okay. Well, it is 
the end of another Thursday and another Think and Link. Um, I would like to thank our two amazing guests and a round of applause for what they've done. Yes. <laughs> Not at all a shameless plug for a book. <laughs> well done. Order Paco's books, have all of them. <laughs> okay, and the 22 years I think applies very well to QR code. So go find that QR code scan and put a review for Capsule because you know that's the only reason we do this is for your great reviews of what we're doing here. Thank you, Paco. Thank you, James. Absolutely amazing. Totally inspired. Thank you everyone for coming. Stay, have conversation. We'll see you all in a month. Thanks, guys. Thank you.